Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the new adventure from Off Planet Media. Um, when I joined Off Planet Radio and we expanded into Off Planet Media, the idea always was that we would have different shows, different concepts, different ideas. And uh, one of the things that has been tossed around for a long time and that I've been really trying to find focus for has been this idea of a health show from an alchemical perspective. And today we begin that journey. And uh, so welcome. This uh, show is called Inter Internal Alchemy. And I will be bringing on guests who have a lot to say about health, but from a slightly different perspective than you would normally get even from an alternate health kind of show. Uh, I think the situations that we're facing in the world right now require works of magic to deal with. And uh, that magic should be practiced on the inside first before we uh, try and change the outside. And so to uh, start the series off, I have an amazing guest today that I'm super excited to have joining me. My guest is a chiropractor and an advanced nutrition response testing practitioner. She is originally from Amsterdam, Dam Holland, and began her practice in 2001 in New Jersey, where she quickly became one of the East Coast's leading practitioners. Her passion for travel and culture soon brought her to Southern California, where she established a nutritional healing center in Santa Monica. She later joined and eventually became owner of what is now the Keysbury Health Center in Glendale, California. As a former professional jockey, she is an avid equestrian enthusiast, and her passion for a happy, balanced life is evident in how she works with clients and is a major part of her par uh, treatment paradigm. Her willingness to walk into the woo is what attracted me and my friends to her. We affectionately call her Dr. K or Dr. Keys. Let me introduce you to an amazing healer, Dr. Claudia Ann Keysbury. Welcome to Internal Alchemy. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm really excited to have you here. You haven't had a ton of exposure or anything like that in the alternative media, and I always like to start with something fresh and new, so I'm very excited about this. Why don't you explain to people kind of what, I mean, I think everybody knows what a chiropractor is, but I've noticed that you, you don't, I haven't seen you, maybe you just don't use it a lot with me. I haven't seen you use a ton of that. I've really been experienced, my experience with you has really been more of this thing with the nutrition response testing. And I think a lot of people don't know what that is. So maybe you can tell people a little bit about what that is and how you got from chiropractic to that. Sure. I um, started just regularly adjusting people on a daily. And like you said, maybe I just don't do it on you. I do adjust presently. Mm -hmm. But you're right, you haven't needed that, you know, so that you haven't seen that side of it. But uh, I think the biggest um, addition to my repertoire now, as we like to call it, is the fact that I had the schooling of a chiropractor, mm -hmm. because that kind of puts me in a, in a different bit of a, a niche, you know, when I'm handling things, because, and being a professional athlete in the past, mm -hmm. I incorporate everything together when I'm figuring out the vitamin part of it, which is the nutrition response testing, right? Nutrition response testing involves using herbs and vitamins and muscle testing. I'm sure uh, most of the people nowadays are, are aware of what muscle testing is. If it's, if you're not, it's called applied kinesiology and it's the use of the arm, whether the joint locks or not, and how you respond to whatever is put on your body that is nutrition response testing. So you're responding to the nutrition you put on your body and the answer is revealed through the arm in our case. There are many ways to get answers, but I like to use the arm. That's what I was taught and it works really well for me. Yeah, so there, there's like a, there's a, a number of different um, schools of thought around sort of muscle testing or nutrition response testing. What is What is the sort of training in the school and the kind of, school of thought with that that you come from? So I think like everything in my life, pretty much I've come up with my own theory of That's how it really works. Yeah. Not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's me talking to your brain without you getting in the way you and your perceived feelings and, and, you know, your ideas of what's right and wrong. So yeah. uh, what I was taught was if you're, arm responds in a strong manner, then it means one thing. And if it goes weak, then it means another, which, you know, that still holds true today. That's pretty much everything, the difference between a strong and a weak. However, a weak is not always a no or a negative, And the strong is not always a yes or a positive. It's really, uh, you're looking for a reaction. So when you're when your arm stays strong, let's say I put vitamin C on your body, you know, who doesn't really need vitamin C? So if I put this vitamin C on your body, your arm remains strong. Now, if that arm were to go weak, 
That doesn't mean your body doesn't want vitamin C, right? It just, it leads me into another area. And so it gets complicated. So is that where it's like, maybe it's the kind of vitamin C or the delivery system or the dosage or whatever. So there's like another question to ask. Correct. Any or all of the above. It could be the brand doesn't suit your body. It could be that, you know, you've just got enough in your body right now. So your brain's telling me, no, I don't really need that right now. And it could be something as, uh, in depth as you have an underlying uh, allergy to something that's in that particular sea. So, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm reading a, a, I just finished reading a book on, on basically on muscle testing by Donald Lepore. And mm -hmm. it was, uh, it, it's, you know, talking a lot about how, well, it's great. Like you might need vitamin C, but if you have a rice allergy and there's rice in the capsule, right, right. Or something like that, then you're going to have an allergic reaction. So whatever the vitamin C may or may not be doing is, um, is irrelevant because now your body is inflamed and reactive. That's right. It's one of the trickiest things that as you get more experience with this, you start realizing when something's truly good, if the body actually is depleted in it, or if there's a chance that there's something in there that the person is allergic to, but they really do need what you, what you, what you feel intuitively, especially that they need, but they're yeah. just not telling you that they need it. Yeah. So I came to you after uh, years of not going to any doctors at all. Like I had been completely, you know, for lots and lots of reasons, which probably everyone in, in the audience has the same feelings about doctors. I, I hadn't really been to like a regular checkup to a doctor for probably almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, when um, a, few of my, a few of my friends or, you know, clients of yours were like, no, she's good. Like, you can trust her. She's weird. She's like, All the stuff you like and you'll totally love her and whatever. But I was even nervous before coming to you for the first time. You know what I mean? How, you know, and it seems like, I mean, I've spent a fair amount of time in your office. I observe the people that sort of come and go. And it seems like there's some people that are coming into you that have some significant health issues that aren't, you know, like for me, it was like at the time I came, I was having an issue with parasites I didn't know about, it, you know, right. that, Right. But, you know, in general, I'm in fairly good health. But, you know, I see some people come in who are seem like they have some significant health problems and stuff like that. A lot of people are uh, someone like my father is on the fence about stuff like this. Right. He thinks only traditional medicine that, you know, this could be dangerous and whatever. What do you say to people like that? Because I everyone I know that has come to you has found significant help, uh, you know, that they needed. Um, and you don't seem afraid to take on bigger health issues. So what is, what do we have to overcome as a culture in order to stop relying on something for help that is actually harming us? Well, it, it varies with every person, as you can well imagine. Of course, age comes into it because if I'm dealing with an elderly person, you know, society has pretty much brainwashed everyone, right? Uh, we, we learn, we are taught in school that Western medicine is the answer it's just ingrained in us that medical doctors know what they're doing and they are the only ones that can really help you. So that's the fight we have, you know, trying to just open up people's minds. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you the muscle testing, when you do it in person really helps, especially with the elderly who are set in their ways mm -hmm. because they cannot for the life of them figure out why their arm could be strong one second and then it's not strong the next. And especially men, If they, if little old me, you know, five, five, 120 pounds is able to get their arm where they can't hold it up, then that's significant for them. But, you know, it's also a lot of talk. I mean, I, you have to, and you learn over time, you have to learn how to approach, you feel people when they come in, if they're like, right set in their mind that they're not going to believe a thing you say, then, you know, my question is, why are you here? <laughs> you know, so... You just have to gingerly assess the situation and you become kind of like a, a detective, you know, it's like, Ooh, what, is this person, how they're going to react, you know, what approach can I, because really ultimately I just want to help them. So I'm hoping that they're not so resistant that they're going to not take something that's really going to help them. So I, I do my best to, uh, kind of convince them to at least give it a try. You are, you are like a detective. It's fascinating to watch you work. Like you get something and you, you really, you get onto something and you start sniffing it out and where do we go next? And it, it is, <laughs> yeah. it's cute. I like watching, I like watching. You get excited when you're like, Ooh, I have, this is new. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of fun and fascinating. Did you ever consider going the traditional route and being a traditional doctor? Like, was that I something? did. I did actually. And, uh, 
It was for a veterinarian school, though. I applied for <clears throat> vet school originally. And, um, you know, it's when the universe intervenes. It just wasn't happening. I got accepted at various schools, and it was so darn expensive. And, you know, I don't come from wealth. So I was just like, how am I going to go to vet school? It's virtually impossible. Yeah. So anyway, my, my default was chiropractic school. <laughs> ah. And it wasn't like I didn't like chiropractic. Uh, you know, I was a jockey, so I had many sessions with chiropractors helping me get over injuries and stuff. So I knew kind of what it was like. But it never really occurred to me to become one. And then once I did, oh, my goodness, I knew exactly that I was where I was supposed to be. And then that brings me to how did we start this vitamin thing? Well, after two or three years of being a chiropractor, I realized there has to be more to this than just adjusting and adjusting and adjusting. I'm not the type that likes just doing the same thing over and over again. So always looking for challenges, always looking for alternate routes. And so a, a good friend of mine started the nutrition response testing. And the minute she told me about it, boom, the light bulb went off. I like, okay, this is for me. This is going to be the answer to what I've been praying for to show up in my life, you know? And uh, that was the beginning of the, all of it. Yeah. It's a really interesting tool. I mean, like all of us who have any concern for our health and well being, we understand like, you know, the eat healthy and take care of yourself and exercise and whatnot. But this is like a really interesting, you know, tool key, right, to get right to the answer, to not have to necessarily go through weeks and months of year and years of trying to sort of try this diet, try that diet, try this sort of thing. When I heard about it, um, I went to a, a standard process, you know, like a, a lecture. And, I, yeah. Yeah, and I was talking to the guy, one of the guys who organizes it, and I was telling him about off planet radio. We were just asking me what I did and whatnot. Cause you know, and I was telling him about it and I was telling him about some things about mind control and this, that, and the other thing and whatever. And he comes back to me and he's like, you know, there's this woman that I know that, you know, practice that, that is a, is a ther as a psychologist or a psychiatrist of some sort. And she practices this and she uses some other technique that is computerized brainwave kind of stuff like that she might be really, you know, like, this might be a really interesting match. She might be really interested in what you're doing. And she's, you know, you're moving into the nutritional field. You could learn from her, blah, blah, blah. And so he, he she's looking for an assistant. And that didn't turn out to be, a, you know, a right matchup for me. And I think she, someone, you know, came back. We, I never, I went, I went and met her, but nothing ever ended up happening. But I liked that what I saw. And so then when I found out that you did the same thing, I was like, okay, something's trying to tell me that this is, you know, something's trying to come in. To me, it's an obvious, it's a no brainer. I mean, you know, I don't see how we're obviously in a mess, right? And people want healing, people want to feel better and whatnot. But I don't see how any kind of, uh, modality can work if the environment inside the body is not conducive to holding any work that's done, right? That's like, right. That's isn't right. that kind of how NRT started? Is that it was, it was, you know, chiropractors finding that people were having to come back for the same adjustment week after week after week, it wasn't holding? Isn't that? No. Yeah, like I, I'm not 100% on that, but I believe that it had something to do with it. Yeah, because yeah. The, the, the gentleman that I learned from, Dr. Yulan, he that's, is yeah. a chiropractor, right? Mm -hmm. So, I do believe there were other people doing applied kinesiology, the muscle testing, that were not chiropractors. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's just like people thinking outside the box, just like I did. Go seek, yeah. find what you need, and the rest is history, you know. And so, and then pass on the good word. If you make money at it, well, great. But you know, help people. That's the main, the main thing. Yeah, that Yulon method was the first one I was aware of. And then for my school, I'm reading this. I just finished this book by Donald Lepore, who is a naturopath, who yeah. is a little bit different. His, his, this is, I don't know if you've ever read his book, The Ultimate Healing System. It's kind of fascinating. I'm kind of like, wow, I really love this book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's some yeah. interesting, yeah. really interesting stuff in there, you know, with metabolic antagonism and different kinds of, you know, really interesting ways of looking at stuff. Um, did you find when you first started using it pretty immediately that people who nothing was working for before with what you were doing with adjustments, things started working when you yes. brought this in right away, you noticed it? Immediately. And honestly, when I started, I knew nothing. <laughs> and I was still getting, I was still getting good results. Like yeah. compared to what I 
how I operate now and what I do now, I absolutely knew nothing. And I was getting people well much faster and more effectively than adjusting them. And there's nothing, you know, I love adjusting. That's, that's my, my baby is chiropractic. Mm. But I think this day and age requires more. That's all yeah. there is to it. In the old days, you could get an adjustment and it would completely heal you. Yeah. But, you know, our environment, the food we eat, the water we drink, it's, it's just not enough now. It's not so, enough. So let's, let's get into that. Like that's, I think, where things really start to get interesting. Um, you see lots of people. I mean, you have a very active clinic and whatnot. Um, we all obviously know that, you know, we're being poisoned from every angle. Yeah. What are you seeing in people? Like what is, if you were going to like pick two or three things to talk about that you are noticing as like what people are coming in with, uh, some sort of problem that you have identified as a problem, but you're unsure, you have ideas about where it may be coming from or what may be the cause of it or whatnot. Um, what, what would those be? Like what, is, what are people really being affected by right now? Um, so uh, environmentally, the main the main things I find are metals, heavy metals, you know, mm -hmm. lead, mercury, chromium, nickel, all the things that are in our environment all the time. Mm -hmm. Chemicals, and that could be anything, right? Right now, air pollution is big. Whatever is in the air right now is really affecting people, and it's not, which brings me to the other thing, I find viruses and bacteria in the air all the time. Mm -hmm. So those would be the main four that I work with, but that's not to say there's not a lot of fungus and mold around because you, if you live in LA, you know there's mold in almost every house, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are, are the main things. And because I do see a lot of people, I see trends and I'm very aware of trends. Mm -hmm. So I'll have three weeks of people and they've all got the same virus. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? That's how it started in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, it would be three or four weeks of bacteria. Yeah. And then those are, are at small increments. Then I started year after year noticing the same time of the year. And then, it, you know, be, it, I realized it was like, okay, well, this is flu season. But then, of course, it wasn't flu that I was finding in people. It was some other weirdo virus. That so, they're just calling the flu. That they're calling the flu. Exactly. exactly. Right. It's like a catch-all term where it's like, you know, they create whatever this condition is with the flu shot, and then people don't feel good a few weeks later. So, you know, then they have That's the right. flu, right? Yeah. They have whatever the shot caused is what they have now, right? They're actually, yeah. they're calling it, at, this is a funny thing, and this is how people don't, like, understand how sometimes how this works, is the thing that they're offering is the antidote is actually the problem in the first place, right? And they're telling you exactly what it is. It's a flu shot. It's going to give you the flu. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it cracks me up. It cracks me up because I'll have people come in and go, oh, you're not going to be happy. But, you know, I took the flu shot uh, three weeks ago or two weeks ago. And then they're laying on the table sick as a dog. And I'm like, oh, well, you got the flu. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly what you asked for. Yeah. It's very um, common. It's very common. Do you... Um... A lot of people are having to take flu shots and vaccines and things like that, that they would not. I mean, most of the people in my audience, you don't have to explain to them the dangers of vaccines and flu shots. They, they already understand that. But some of them work in the healthcare profession or in schools or whatever, and they're being forced to take flu shots and vaccines you know, against their will, basically, if they would like to keep their job or are having to let their have their children take them for their child to remain in school. Are there things that can be done after that to, re to fix the situation, to clear the body out, to counteract whatever has happened, whatever trauma has been introduced? Absolutely. It's uh, whatever you get, there's always a remedy to pull it out. And that's what I do. I just yeah. find what we need, find what we need to get it out. And we, that's, that's what we do. You know? So, I mean, while there is value, obviously, in resistance and, and, and you know, insisting on informed consent and not going along with the program, it, when pushed up against the wall, people shouldn't be fearful. There's something that can be done. Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's my big thing. You know, as soon as you go into that fear, then you're lowering your vibration, you're lowering your resistance, and things that maybe were going to happen are probably going to happen to you. It's yeah. like it locks it in. Exactly. It yeah. allows it to happen. But the, um, 
the thing that I always tell people about vaccines, I am not anti protecting everyone. <laughs> That's not what I am, right? Right. I hate vaccines because I see no need to fill them with all the crap they're putting in there. Yeah. The idea, the idea is beautiful. Get your immune system aware of what's out there, get it ready to fight it off, make it easier for your body. That part is amazing. And that's mm -hmm. homeopathy, kind of. Which is, a, right? which is another main part of what you do. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of homeopathic remedies. And it's the similar idea. You're using how your body works to help you rid of an abundance of something. You know, if you've got too much bacteria, because you need bacteria, you need viruses, you need parasites, you need everything. So the whole homeopathic idea is probably where vaccination came from in the first place. Mm -hmm. However, the mercury, the formaldehyde, you know, the preservatives that are in there are what really are suppressing humanity. So that's, that's the part that's the problem. Is there any argument at all for those things being in there? I, I can't, you know, like, you know, just throw a little mercury, a little thimerosal, formaldehyde. Is there any possible... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I know the answer, but I'm wanting to check with you just because you're more the expert than I. Is there any rational reason why those things should be there? Well, I guess for anyone trying to be rational about it is it's a preservative. Use it, use, um, quote unquote, as a preservative, then there may be hidden agendas behind that, but we'll, you know, right. that go for now. What about using something more healthy for the body as the preservative? Right. Because otherwise, yes, you're going to produce, mass produce these vaccines. It's not cost effective if they all spoil, if you don't use them. Like now I believe right. they last years and years and years and they yeah. don't go bad. Right. But, you know, that's like having food in a can that says uh, expiration date 10 years from now. Right. Do you want to eat that stuff? Right. I don't. Right. No. Yeah. So I, I guess that's, I understand the rationale, money, cost effectiveness, business sense. I get it, but it's hurting everyone. So that part, no excuse for that. I don't yeah. like it. I don't agree with it. And I, you know, that's never going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So we just had like the noisiest plane ever fly over. <laughs> like it was vibrating the whole house. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Um, so with the vaccines, have, you know, Let's just like, you know, go there for a minute. Do you, I mean, obviously in my, in our community, people think there's, you know, an agenda behind it with the introduction of all this stuff. You also, and we'll get into this more in the second hour, um, but you also work a lot in energetics and things like that. And like one of the ideas that I've had is some of these kinds of chemical things, particularly something like mercury or whatever, are something that's really easy for certain kinds of energies or even entities to sort of attach to to magnetize to, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to me, um, that seems like a possibility as to why they'd want to introduce that to the system. Also, the heavy metals in our body, you know, to react with all of these frequencies that we're being exposed to. Like we have, you know, obviously, you know, cell towers and microwave frequencies, EMF, ELF, 5G is coming, right? And having metals in the body, right? And obviously they're spraying it in the air, it's in our food. And, you know, you're getting a dose of it, you know, right away as a baby with vaccines and things like that. Do you see that as like, you know, a possibility as to, even just on that higher esoteric energetic level of yes. being able to act like a sort of, you know, like a, a tag, like a chip, like a tracking chip or a, a connected, you know, a connector between the uh, out of body realm and the in body realm? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's all of the above. And uh, to me, the since you know I'm always going after the root cause, but I believe the root reason is suppression, general mm -hmm. mass suppression. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in the, in the days where they used mercury, they thought mercury, the idea was introduced, and I'm not sure by whom, that it was good for you. Do you remember? I don't know if you've heard about that part of history where they bit. were using mercury as a cure-all for almost everything. Right. And that was in the time of the Mad, Mad Hatter's disease. Have you yes. heard of that? Yes, yes. Right? So the um, mercury in the felt hats, and back then everyone wore a hat, right? Yeah. It was actually making people go crazy because the mercury was just leaching into their brains through the, yeah. from the hat, through their skin. And so we learned early, Abraham Lincoln, if you ever watch his biography, 
he tried mercury as a cure for his depression and other things that he was going through. And it almost uh, drove, drove him completely mad. Like huh. he recognized that because he was brilliant. So he's like, Oh, this is really making me crazy. I need to get up. But it took him a little while. Yeah. So anyway, I thought it was really interesting. So the history in this country, we are well aware of how bad mercury is. Mm -hmm. So why the heck? Is it still in, in so many things? And why did mercury fillings, mercury fillings. come around? And, and then they want to call the people who say they're receiving transmissions from outer space and their teeth crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So did yeah. you ever, I have some, uh, a theory about mer mercury in particular. And I always, you know, they tell us more in fiction than they do in, in, in truth, right? They do. You ever, did you ever watch the TV show Fringe? I may have watched it a couple of times. No, yeah. You should watch, go, go binge on that. You, you guys yeah. go binge on that whole series. And then, then you and I can have some really interesting conversations. But in that, in Fringe, there's an alternate universe, right? There's a parallel universe where everything is almost exactly the same as ours, but, but different, right? Like there, you know, the Twin Towers were still there. There, you know, Eric Stoltz was the star of Back to the Future. There, you know, things are almost the same, but not quite, right? And there's a carbon copy of you. Like in this universe, there was Olivia, and in the other one, they called her, well, they called her Olivia over there, but on this side, they would call her faux Olivia, right? Oh, okay. Like this Olivia, <laughs> not as good, right? Okay, it's yeah. Safe. But at a certain point, there became a war between these universes, right? Because people on both sides had been, you know, playing with high technology and interrupting the natural state. It's perfectly fine if there's another universe right next to us that we can't see because it exists at a different frequency. But when you right. start playing with things like maybe something like CERN or an atomic bomb, atomic bomb or whatever and start creating ripples in you know, the fabric of space and time, you know, stuff starts to happen. So these two universes, you know, were colliding basically. And the other one thought that this one was at war with it. So it started doing, you know, preventative measures. And one of the things that it would do what they would do over there was send over shapeshifters, right? So they'd send over these shapeshifters that could basically kill a person and then they had a device that would make them appear to be the other person. The, uh, the, advice, the device was attached in the palate of the mouth, right? And they would turn into this other person. But their the body, the one they killed, the person yeah. that they killed, but their bodies were not filled with stuff ours was, they were filled with mercury. Oh. Right. And so I wonder, like, if what we were talking about, like, it, it, there, there's, you know, maybe in reality, it's not such a physical thing. It's more of an energetic thing. But there is a need for Mercury to be present for whatever, you know, energy entity spirit kind of thing to come in. And you oh. think there's a lot of disincarnate spirits out there. Right. And they yeah. want to introduce Mercury to a brand new baby. Well, what better way to for someone to, you know, be introduced back in? Right, That's then right. That's new right. baby. So go check out, go check out Fringe sometime, and uh, give you a whole new idea about why Mercury might be present everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I I don't watch a ton of TV, but I've noticed really lately, especially that all this I call them disclosure shows. Yeah, <laughs> because they're supposed to be not real fiction, you know, but. Everything that I'm learning, they're all exactly accurate, and these things are actually happening. And it's all just getting people used to it, even though it's portrayed as not real, you know, so that they won't be so shocked when the truth is revealed. Yeah. We'll get into some of that stuff in the second segment. Um, but th just because you brought that up, these disclosures, so, so part of this line in Fringe with these shapeshifters, right? is that all of the politicians have been taken over by them, right? Oh, that's no so, surprise. Right, so that's exactly, so people are here just, you know, they're swinging back and forth, Democrat, Republican, blah, 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 they're all, they've all been taken, they're all being, you know, mind controlled by some, you know, right. entity right. that exists outside of our visual perception, but is, you know, snacking on everybody's, you know, loose harvest from the political nonsense, right? Well, meanwhile, the uh, politicians have all been taken over, so yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you mentioned chemicals, and metals and viruses and bacteria, which leads us to the obvious elephant in the room, which is, you know, however people prefer to call it, chemtrails, geoengineering, you know, atmospheric aerosol programs, whatever, yeah. right? And, you know, I, I, we've had some conversations about it. I don't, we haven't really gotten into like, you know, any what you think like the deep, the purpose behind it is or the multi-level purpose behind it. You mentioned mercury and nickel and some other metals, but you didn't mention some of the metals that we are told are the 
the big makeup of, of chemtrails, which is aluminum, barium, and strontium, right? So like the people who are like the geoengineering purists kind of thing, they just want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about the idea that there could be nanotechnology in there or that there could be intentionally like cross-domain bacteria or live viruses, funguses, yeasts, molds, or whatever. They just want to talk about like, you know, the, the, the scientific accept the scientifically accepted things that are right. So my question to you is: Do all of those things that I mentioned exist? Are, is yeah. the delivery system for? Are you finding that in the body? Are you finding nanotechnology? Are you finding? Uh, I think some of these um, weird kinds of viruses, bacteria, yeast, fungus, even are like programmed. They're like a, a, a hybrid of technology and organic stuff like that. Well, what are you finding? What do you think? All of the above. I am finding all of that. But isn't that for part two of this show? <laughs> uh, no, we're gonna get the, we're gonna get into the weirder, weirder, woo -weir. Oh, okay. but yeah. But if you want, we, we can push some of that over there. But so, from what you're finding clinically, though, all that stuff exists. Oh yeah, yeah. And the more I learn, the more I find. It's kind mm -hmm. of a interesting thing happening right now. Yeah, and what is you know? There's like a school of thought out there that this stuff really only exists for people who believe in it, right? Like, uh, yeah. you know, my dad doesn't think that there are chemtrails, and so is he not affected by them, right? Oh, no, no. <laughs> he's definitely affected by them, yes. Do you, and, and you know, people come into your clinic who don't have this body of knowledge about stuff. Do you, <laughs> what do they think is happening? I mean, with this kind of thing. I mean, I see just you know, kids come into your place and. Yeah, uh, as you can well imagine, some people I can tell right away, they'd never be open to it. So I might say the word chemtrail and they'll look at me like I've got three heads mm -hmm. and I'm like, Google it. Yeah. I, tell them, I tell them, look it up. If you have questions about it, come and ask me, but I don't push the issue or anything. I don't try to convince people. That's not really my style, mm -hmm. but most people I have to tell you, as soon as I say chemtrail, even if I thought they were the type of person that wouldn't know what that was, they're like, Oh my God, you know about those, you know? And, Ah. They go off because almost everyone realizes those are not real clouds up in the air at this point. <laughs> not everybody. Some right. people surprise me, and I think they're pretty in the know, and they're not at all. But, yeah, most people have a pretty darn good idea that those are not normal clouds up there. Right, yeah. Then there's a few people who just insist that they're contrails, right? And that's kind of like the flu shot, right? The, 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 the purpose is right there in the name, the contrail. That's the big con. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, yes. But you know, most people, if you pull it up on the computer and you look at contrail, it's like the uh, natural condensation that takes place from a plane lasts about uh, 10 to 30 seconds. Yeah. And so- when Like when we were little, like when we were little, we would watch yeah. the it disappear behind, it was so cool. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So then I asked them, so if these are contrails, then why are they still in the sky hours later in the exact trail that that plane left that thing behind? Right, and, and, and spread, spread out width-wise. Spread yeah. out, yeah. yeah. And why is there a black one and a white one? And <laughs> why are there, you know, it goes on and on. But some of it is, I, I some of it is crazy, like, the, like some of them go straight up. Right, and they swirl oh, like this. Now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so like you know, there was a time when they were all just at an angle and whatever. And okay, like I suppose if somebody was dense, you could make the argument. Yeah, well, a plane could have done that. But right, these are right. going in directions and making arcs and things that planes, at least not passenger planes or cargo planes, make. Right. That's so. Right. That's right. You've got curly yeah. cues. Now you've got chem bombs. Chem bombs. Yep. Yeah. Released and it just explodes like a, a firework right in the middle. Yep. I saw one today. Yeah. But I have to tell you, not to get too woo-woo, but right now, the things that we think are chemtrails are up there are chemtrails, but they're positive chemtrails. I got a huge sense a couple of weeks ago, especially, and I got it again today, that when I look around up there, I'm like, oh, wow, these are positive things. This, some, this whatever they're releasing right now is cleaning up the air, not poisoning us. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? Because one of the things, like, you know, we don't, you know, I, I think there's multiple things going on up there, right? I think for every, you know, like there's in the universe, there's an equal and opposite reaction to everything that happens, right? Somebody dumps yep. a bunch of crap, somebody comes along and tries to clean it up. Somebody, right? But, it, yep. you know, there's also people who, you know, 
we all need to be cautious of the love and light and the hopium crew and all that, you know, who are just selling you nonsense. So can you, right. can you explain to us a little further what, what that would mean? Why you think that, you know, I know you do a lot of, in, you know, intuiting and, you know, energy kind of work and whatnot, but what is happening that is making you think that this is something that is beneficial or at least neutral and not harmful? It is, it's a, uh, it's a combination, mostly purely my, intuition mm -hmm. because, as you know that's really developed especially yes, highly recently. highly yeah so uh, a couple of years ago i would you know look at the chemtrails and i would kind of just intuit that there were virus there was a ton of virus in that chemtrail and don't you know it like i said before i see a lot of people so i see trends and all of a sudden if i saw that then within a few days everyone would be coming in with virus so after the 10th or 20th time of that happening, I started to realize, oh, I can feel what's in these things. You know, what? I, it's, it's correct. Mm -hmm. So then I got this feeling of war. I started getting this war-like feeling when I would look up in the skies. And then the, I don't know if it's a download or what it is, but all of a sudden I was like, wow, this is good versus evil. Those are bad chemtrails. These are good. And the good are... Uh, nullifying the effects of the bad that's what's happening right now so that's interesting so there's lots of schools of thought and one is that that some of the part of the reason for some of these programs is to hide that there's a war happening in the sky or a war happening in the heavens and so they're trying to block us from being able to see or sense that so there's that and then there's also i, I mean what i have a friend sean gatreau he's been on the show several times who talks about he documents what he calls the cloaked cloud craft right in the sky and these are craft that exist that generate things that look sort of like clouds around them as the cloaking device right some of them seem to uh vacuum up or or suck up the chemtrails like the, the the linear chemtrails and so you could say okay are they there cleaning it up that's a possibility or right. do some of these craft actually run on those chemtrails? Is that their ignition? Is that what they use to their, their, their propellant system, right? Like if it's an energy, you know, if they don't use traditional uh, fuel or whatnot, is there a chemical combination that they use and that, you know, that's maybe part of the reason for laying some of these. So some of these craft that may be, you know, high technology or uh, otherworldly or, um, you know, biotechnological in nature or whatnot, um, any hits on that kind of stuff? Like, do you, you know what I mean? Any thoughts about those, those kinds of ideas? Yeah, I, I get thoughts like that all the time. And then I always just kind of test it, you know, in my own, the way I test things and I rule them out pretty quickly. And then I carry on with the ones I know are going on. So the cloaking, forget about it. Our skies are full of crafts constantly. We just, you know, they're all cloaked. They're yeah. all, they're all hiding. They don't need chemtrails to hide. No, no, the chemtrail doesn't hide. Uh, the chemtrails would be hiding like some sort of battle happening in the sky. These cloaking craft, or what I'm talking about, is that they actually generate. It's a craft there, and it generates the the whatever like a cloud. Right, looks, right. Clouds that look fake. They don't look like chemtrails, but they don't look like real clouds like we had when we were a kid. They look yeah. wispy and funky, and they're weirdly shaped and whatever. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 No, I I got you. I got you. And I my thing is, I think all the the warfare that's going on we don't see any of it because they're all cloaked not yeah. necessarily by chemtrails gotcha i don't think they need that and i don't think they need chemtrails for their form of energy either i i'm, I, I'm not that doesn't yeah they're just ideas that doesn't jive kind of, with me yeah it yeah doesn't feel right to me but yeah it's wrong of course yeah but, uh yeah but i have and i'll show you later i actually caught a picture of something in the back and like in the sky so i'm gonna i'm gonna send you that picture later. okay cool very cool yes awesome yeah. very cool and then you know sort of as we're like winding down the first segment here one of the things that i notice and and really uh appreciate about uh, I, I love coming to your office it's a pleasant place to, to hang out and yeah. um you seem to really enjoy your work and you seem to enjoy the you work with the, not only the clients, but the people that are in your office. So it becomes a way to have a healthy, balanced life and get to spend time with the people that you largely would want to spend time with anyway. And it, it, it's like, it's fun to go there. It's the complete opposite experience of going to a doctor's office, right? Right. So how have you found this balance in your life? And can you talk a little bit about like how, how important that is and how for us to really find 
work to do that is fulfilling to us, but also allows us to be around the people that we want to be around and, and have a full life, not just a work life and a separate private life that right, is right, from right. each other. Well, you know, I'm just super grateful that I'm in the situation I am and I can pick and choose who works in my office and I've chosen to have it this way, right? Yeah. And I'm not that blind to see that a lot of people, most people don't have that option. Do I find it important? Absolutely. It's crucial. It's crucial, especially a person like me who gets bored very easily. <laughs> like, you know, I'm already thinking, oh, do I want to stay in this office? Where do I want to move to? How can I make this different for me? Because it's getting mundane every day, in a, day in and day out. The thing that keeps me going is I was sent to California, especially. I was sent to LA, and I, I, knew, I know that now more than ever. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I just picked up from New Jersey, left everything I knew, and loaded up a trailer, attached my car, and here I was living in Santa Monica when I first got here. So I just knew I was meant to be here and to help. And that's what it all boils down to for me. Mm -hmm. The work, you know, life is what you make it. So if you want to be happy at work and you don't have a choice in what you're doing, you still can make it happy by choosing to have things a certain way. And that's what I've done. The, the icing on the cake is that I love what I do. And the more interesting cases I have, you know, like I'm, you've seen me at work. I'm like a mad scientist. I'm like yeah. putting things together and then hitting the energy world to get more info. You know, that's just brought me to an entirely different level. And it's been, it's been fascinating. I have to say I'm, I'm yeah. still in the throes of it. You know, I'm not tired of it. I'd rather work with animals than with people, but <laughs> when, wouldn't we all? <laughs> I know, right? I know. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they don't complain. They always love you. They, you know, they want That's your right. attention That's all the time. They're more, they're more in tune with their energy. Mm -hmm. So they know when they're feeling gratitude. Like everybody that brings their dogs in there, the dogs don't act at all like they do in any other office. And yeah. it's because of the energy. Yeah. And after, after one treatment, the dogs come in and the owners always look at me like, wow, they're, you know, my dog is just so happy right now. <laughs> because they know they're coming for help, right? Yeah. And immediate help. Yes. It's immediate help. So. Yeah. So you, it's interesting that you were, you know, called here to Los Angeles. You know, I'm, I'm from here. Uh, I was born and raised here. I've lived all over the country, but I keep ending up back here. And at a certain point I, it became clear to me that like, this is where, I don't know that I love these terms, but this is where the battle is. Like if, right, if, right. where this is where you know, the good and evil kind of come together and where you can make it, you know, that's what Hollywood is, is basically, right? Right, right. I was just where, gonna say that's Hollywood. And, and mm -hmm. because yes, if you know me, I am nothing like what people that like being in LA are. Right. It's, it's not me, Yeah. you know? I'm looking forward to the day where yeah, I skip. Yeah, but you know, for now it's my calling. I'm meant to be here, and who knows for how long that'll be. Yeah, yeah I was having the conversation with somebody yesterday about like people who are like really from LA and people who come here and behave in the way that they think people from LA should act. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. It's funny, right? It's pretty, it's pretty funny, and so yeah, I see Los yeah. Angeles completely differently than most people do. You know, it's it's a really interesting place, and I do think it's sort of it's the eye of the storm. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to agree with you. I tend to yeah. agree. With you. Yeah. All right. So we're winding down this first segment here, but this is the, the public segment. So why don't you let people know how they can find you, how they can get in touch with you. Uh, you know, if they would like to be a client, you offer remote services as well as in-office services. Tell people where they can find you. I do. I do. They can go to, uh, hopefully they have a computer and they can go to my website, www.keysberryhealthcenter.com. Uh, we're easy to find. The numbers are there. The contact information's there. And yeah, that's about it. If you, you guys, she works remotely, so don't be afraid to reach out if you live in another state or even another country. And that's right. if you guys are anywhere in the Southern California area or you're going to be taking a trip here or, or whatever, I highly recommend going in and seeing her in person. It's a it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun, it's an interesting and fun experience. And, you know, even if you, you know, it will start you down sort of a different path of looking at the, the way you look at your health and your body and, and whatnot. And um, I'm super delighted to know you and get to benefit from your, 
your wisdom and your just I, I also just really like you as a person so oh, well, thanks Emily <laughs> thank you, absolutely so thank you for being my first guest and for those of you who, who uh, support us on patreon I really appreciate that and if you don't yet please join us at uh, patreon.com forward slash off planet media and if you go there you can find the second hour we're gonna get weird all righty guys I'll see you <laughs> next time <laughs> peace out all right